Let's go ahead and get back started. And as recall, we left off with our, we just got to our first detail of the narrative of the fall of man. And that first detail we looked at was the serpent. And we saw how the catechism and the heritage of our faith identifies the serpent as Satan. That angelic being created by God who disobeyed God, chose not to serve God, fell out of relationship with God. A real angelic being who was indeed the seductive voice that manipulated and tempted our first real human parents that really disobeyed God. Note the really emphasis in those statements, okay? It's not just a figment of the imagination or a legendary story. Okay, the second thing I'd like to note about the serpent is the appearance of the serpent. We left off with asking the question, how does Satan appear to Adam? And the reason why we ask this question is in light of the command in Genesis 2.15 that God gives to Adam. God commands Adam to till and keep the garden. Now as Dr. Scott Hahn and many other uh, biblical scholars point out, the two Hebrew words there for till and keep were abodah and shamor. In the literal translation of shamor is gourd, can mean to gourd. And it's actually used in reference to the Levitical priest in the book of Numbers and other places where it speaks of the Levitical priest gourding the wilderness tabernacle, right? Or gourding Solomon's temple. So shamor can mean to gourd. So in other words, God is commanding Adam to gourd the gourden. Now, we know what or who Adam was to gourd the gourden from. We all know it. Hey, it's the devil, right? But we have to ask ourselves this question, as Dr. Scott Hahn does so beautifully in his book, A Father Who Keeps His Promises and various other works of his. You know, why, if Adam was commanded by God to gourd the gourden and to gourd Eve, and Satan comes... And in our common imagination, we think of Satan being just this Gordon variety, slithery serpent, right? Why does Adam let the snake in? Why does Adam fail to guard the Gordon? Perhaps it is because it is perhaps it is because in what he saw. Perhaps it is because of the way Satan manifested himself. And so the interpretive suggestion, now granted this is not de fide, okay? This is not church definitive, authentic interpretation of scripture. So you can take it or leave it. It's a, uh, a suggested interpretation that seems very plausible and reasonable by various uh, biblical scholars. Perhaps Satan manifested himself to Adam in such a way that threatened his life. It was a life-threatening manifestation. Getting back to our discussion about how angels can visibly manifest themselves to our sensory apparatus in different forms, right? Perhaps Satan manifested himself to Adam in a life-threatening manner that caused Adam to cower and fail in his duty to guard the garden and allow the devil in. You ask, what is the evidence, Carlo? Well, let's look at the evidence. Many scholars point out that the, ant, the evidence lies in the Hebrew word that's used for the devil. And the Hebrew word that's used for the devil or the serpent is nahash, right? Now, that Hebrew word nahash can be translated as serpent. But the image of Nahash in the Hebraic mindset was not a slithery garden variety snake as we think it is in modern America. But in the Old Testament when Nahash is used, it's used in reference to a ferocious beast, okay? Now the Greek, in the Greek version of the fall narrative, the Greek is Ophis, O-P-H-I-S. So Hebrew Nahash, Greek Ophis. And the Greek word Ophis is going to be important when we get to the New Testament and we see that word used again. So, our first example where Nahash is used in Hebrew and Ophis is used in Greek in the Hebraic tradition comes from Isaiah chapter 27 
7 verse 1. Here's what Isaiah writes. In that day the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. The fleeing Hebrew Nahash, Greek Ophus. Leviathan, the twisting serpent. There it is, Hebrew Nahash, Greek Ophus. And he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Yes. Adam would have known death. Why would he have been afraid? Well, he wouldn't... That's a very good question. Very good question. Why would he be afraid of death? No, remember? Okay, the question is, why would he be afraid of death? Here's, here's my suggested answer to that. I've asked myself that question as well. It's a good question. What is one of the emotions or... Okay, let me back up. A part of human nature, one of the goods of human nature, is self-preservation, right? Now, having a perfect human nature, Adam would have known about that. Adam would have experienced that, right? Having a perfect human nature, Adam would have known that as man, it's possible for him to die. Right? Because human nature in and of itself is ordered toward death. I mean, the body is ordered to decay. The only reason why Adam would not have died is because it was a part of God's plan if he would have passed the test of love. So Adam, having knowledge of human nature, would have been aware of the human emotion. Uh, uh, I don't know if we'd call it a human emotion, but the human experience of self-preservation, right? So I would answer that question in saying, because Adam is aware of self-preservation he would have experienced the emotion of wanting to preserve himself. And thus, fear. Is fear necessarily bad? No. In and of itself, it's a part of what? Our human nature, right? And so I think it's reasonable to, su su reasonable to suggest that even though he had a perfect human nature before the fall, he still could have experienced fear. In the presence of a ferocious beast who's uh, uh, manifesting himself in a life threatening manner and actually experiencing the human experience of preserve life, preserve life. But you see, as we're going to see, what Adam is called to do, he's called to, as we are all called to do, right? He was called to transcend that human emotion of fear and the human self-preservation. Transcend it for the sake of what? For the sake of God's will, which is what? Gord the Gordon. So as we go through the narrative, one of the things that, you're gonna, that we're going to highlight is that I, it is suggested that God is calling Adam to covenantal love. What is covenantal love? To lay down one's life. And Adam failed in the face of fear and in the face of self-preservation. Adam failed to transcend those two human experiences in laying down his life for the sake of God's will. And that's going to necessitate Jesus to come and do exactly what Adam fails to do. To perfect, to act out perfectly covenantal love, right? Which is what? Self-sacrificial love. So, fundamentally, I think Adam, even though, you know, he would have not have known death yet from his own human experience, he would have had the human experience of self-preservation and even the human emotion of fear. But he was called to transcend it. Think of Jesus, right? And look, if we can fast forward a bit to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus had a perfect human nature, correct? Yes, he did. And consequently, even in that perfect human nature, did Jesus Christ, as man, in light of his human nature, experience the human emotion of fear? Yes, he did. Did he experience the human, the human drive for life self-preservation? Yes, he did. He actually prayed, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thy will. So even in his human nature, Jesus exercised his human will to respond to sanctifying grace in his human soul to transcend human nature. The son had to exercise his human will to transcend his own human nature 
to transcend the human emotion of fear, to transcend the, the, the drive for self-preservation, for what? For obedience to God's will. So once again, what do we have here? The fall of Adam, the, rever- the good news of Jesus, the reverse side of the fall of Adam. And we'll see this played out as we get it systematically. But that's a great question, okay? Is that, is that sufficient so far? Kind of, sort of? Yes, Dan? It sounds like you know, what you're saying is, is that in some way Adam missed the mark. But we know that sin entered the world through Eve. So it sounds like Adam, I mean, if okay. Adam didn't respond in perfect love, Yep. And then he missed the mark, but that doesn't correspond to... Okay, so for the video and the audio sake, the comment was, it seems as if we're saying Adam missed the mark, but we know that sin entered the world through Eve. To respond to that, the Catholic understanding and interpretation of Scripture is not that sin entered the world through Eve, but it entered through Adam. Fundamentally, and this is why, Dan, and for everybody else, this is why, notice in Romans 5, when St. Paul talks about the sin of Adam, notice he doesn't talk about the sin of Eve. When he's talking about how life comes to all through Christ, death came through all through whom? Adam. Isn't it interesting that Paul focuses on Adam and not Eve? Now, was Eve involved in the sin? Indeed, she was. But fundamentally, sin entered the world through the first Adam, through Adam, primarily because he's the head of the human race. Once again, we have that connection between all of humanity in and through this single individual Adam, because he's the head, you see? So, we see this played out. And so the point is, is that in the narrative, now, granted, you know, in, our, in the heritage of our faith, you know, the fundamental act is not until they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? But even the Catholic Church, as the Catechism suggested, that's symbolic in and of itself as well. But we see that Adam, even from this command to gore the Gordon, he's even failing in goring the Gordon in this suggested interpretation of the narrative of the fall of man. So, getting back to the appearance of the Nahash, we see in Isaiah that when Nahash is used, the serpent, in the Hebraic mindset, it's not just a Gordon variety snake, but it's some sort of ferocious beast, like this sea monster or a sea dragon, right? Because it talks about Leviathan, uh, this dragon that is in the sea. Got it? All right, now watch this. Another example to support this idea or this interpretation of the appearance of the Satan. If we go to Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 through 4 and verse 9, when John has his heavenly vision, who does he see? See, woman, male child being born of the woman, and who else? The red dragon. And what does John tell us? He tells us, There I saw a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems upon his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stores of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon, so what's in your imagination right now? A Gordon variety snake or a ferocious beast? ferocious beast. Okay, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child that he might devour her child when she brought it forth. Verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent. The Greek word there? Ophus. The same Greek word that's used in the Greek version of the narrative of the fall of man in reference to Satan. Hebrew Nahash, Greek Ophus. John's telling us this great red dragon is that serpent in the Genesis narrative who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him, right? So we see that both in the Old Testament and in the New, the Ophus in Greek, or the Nahash in Hebrew, the serpent is a ferocious beast. There is no connotation of the Nahash or Ophus being a slithery Gordon variety snake that's non-threatening but a ferocious, massive beast. So if we take that biblical knowledge of Nahash and Ophus and we go back to the Genesis account of the fall of man and therein lies the serpent Nahash or Ophus coming up to enter into the Gordon and Adam's commanded to guard the Gordon, either he's not there and just Satan happens to enter in or Adam allows him to enter in. 
So I don't know about you, but if a massive, ferocious beast of a red dragon-like creature came into my presence, I might be cowering a bit as well. Don't you? I, I, don't, I think I would. Okay, my knees would be shaking a bit. I hope and pray that I could be, you know, the valiant warrior to guard the princess, the queen, right? But I don't know. Various times, I'm not that valiant warrior because that Nahash comes to me in other different ways and I fall flat on my face and sin, right? Okay? So the, the suggested interpretive application is that the reason, a possible reason, why Adam does not guard the Gordon, fails to guard the Gordon from the devil, is because Satan, perhaps, manifested himself to Adam in a visible way that was life-threatening of some sort. And that Adam would have cowered to some degree, allowing the Nahash into the Gordon. So that's the first detail of the narrative that I'd like to draw your attention to. The serpent, the Nahash, the devil, and how he's manifesting himself and the interaction between Adam and the Nahash and why he lets him in. And that's going to set the stage, as we're going to see in a minute, that's going to set the stage for the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay? Detail, yes? How would he guide the guidance for us if he has a human nature in this? Okay, come again on that one. How would he guide the guidance for us if he has a human nature in his dress and sleep? Okay, how could he guard the garden 24 hours a day, 7 days a week? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, but once again, remember, this is figurative language, all right? It, it, it does take on a symbolic nature. So we're, I don't think we can read it literalistically in thinking that Adam is to guard the garden, standing guard 24 hours or 7 days a week. There's something being communicated here that in some way Adam was meant to protect. Uh, and, and we'll think about it like this. Okay, let me take a little stand here. What's another, the, the Garden of Paradise. In our tradition, the Garden of Paradise also is a symbolic or figurative image for the inner life of God dwelling in the soul. The, the, the inner harmony between man and woman and creation, right? That symbolizes, the Garden of Paradise symbolizes that relationship with God and the harmony therein. And so it could very well represent that Adam was meant to guard the life of God in his soul he was meant to guard his bride, Eve, from the influence of the Nahash. He was meant to guard the relationship that he and his bride have with God. That's what the whole garden of paradise represents. So it's not like he's standing at a gate 24-7 fasting from, you know, just on bread and water or something and not getting any sleep. Uh, there's something deeper there. There is an idea of guarding and to some degree it's possible that Adam cowers. Okay? All right. So, yes, Kathy. Does that mean that Eve saw the same? Very good question. Does that mean that Eve saw the same? I think, is it in the text? Well, I mean, if we follow the narrative flow, Nahash means a ferocious creature of some sort, connotes that. And the Nahash, it doesn't say the Nahash changes form. <laughs> it keeps saying the serpent, or Nahash, began to dialogue with Eve, right? So to answer your question, I would think, yes, it's very reasonable to conclude that Satan would have been manifesting himself in this ferocious way as he begins to dialogue with Eve. This leads us to detail number two, Kathy, and that is the manipulation of Satan. Let's take a look at the dialogue between Satan and Eve, or perhaps Satan and Adam and Eve, right? And I'll show you the details in a minute. Okay, part one of the man manipulation, and that is uh, Satan's questioning of God's prohibition in Genesis 3.1. Did God say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Did you catch that? Did God say that you can't eat of any tree in the garden? And Eve responds and says, oh no, God said only the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because God said you can eat of any other tree, but just don't eat of that one, right? But notice how what Satan's doing here. Did God say you can't eat of any tree? Some scholars suggest an interpretive application here that Satan seems to be making God's law 
arbitrary. Satan is trying to get Eve to perceive God's law as arbitrary. In other words, you know, you have all of these trees you can eat from, but just that one don't eat from. Why? Because I'm God and I said so. Type of thing, right? This completely arbitrary law that's imposed upon mankind to limit their freedom and hold them under the tyrannical God's thumb type of thing, right? Because notice, notice the subtle, any tree. Did God say you can't eat from any tree? What's the implication? Well, God said you can eat from any tree but that one. That's arbitrary, right? Now watch this. As the narrative, the dialogue continues in the text, Eve seems to succumb to the arbitrary view. Because listen to how Eve responds in Genesis 3.3. She says, oh, no, no, no. God said uh, we, we can eat from any tree but this tree. And then God also says, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Did God ever say that? No. Interesting detail there. I never saw that until like a few months ago when I was listening to Dr. Brent Petrie's lectures. I'd never realized that. So Eve seems to buy in to the manipulation of Satan that God's law is arbitrary. Yeah, God's law is so arbitrary, he said we can't even touch it. <laughs> but that's not true. So we see Eve falling prey, right, to the seduction and the manipulation of the Nahash. So that's the first part of the manipulation, the questioning of God's prohibition. Now, apply that to our lives. How many times do we hear the common expression about law being negative, right? Oh, law is bad. We need to have freedom and freedom from laws and this sort of negative view of law, and particularly God's laws, right? Very often, that same seductive voice is still present today trying to get us to see God's law as completely arbitrary and, and thus negative and limiting our freedom as opposed to God's law being something for the good and perfection of the human being that can help us flourish and prosper according to our human nature, right? So everything that's in the garden and everything that's going on, it's still present with us today. It's amazing how everything there in the narration of things in Genesis 1 through 3, the creation and the fall, can apply to our life situation. It's unbelievable. Part 2 of the manipulation. And that is the questioning of God's warning about death. In Genesis 3, 4, Satan says, um, Surely you will not die, right? Uh, now, in, within our tradition, we often see this part of the manipulation as Satan, in some way, Satan was right, right? Satan comes and says, Hey, Adam, Eve. Well, in this particular case so far, as we know, Eve, if you eat of the tree of, the no of knowledge of good and evil, surely you won't die, right? And she ate. Did she die and drop dead right away? No. So perhaps Satan was right in some way, right? But here's where the manipulation comes in. The promise that God made, if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall die, right? In our tradition, we understand that that refers to physical death, but on a secondary way, on a secondary level. Because in the original Hebrew text, when God makes the promise, if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall die, the original Hebrew text has die twice. You shall die, die. Interesting. Why the repetition? Well, as I've mentioned before in previous sessions that we've been in together, in the Hebraic culture, they didn't have the superlative. You couldn't say, uh, this is good, this is better, that's the best. Or this is the greatest death. This is one death, but then there's a greater or the greatest death. They couldn't say that. So what did they do to connote the superlative? Repetition. Right? So think of holy, holy, holy. Sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. Isaiah 6, 4. Revelation 4. That connotes that God is the what? Greatest in the category of holiness. You know, so if I were to say Deacon Droman is, um, you know, he's uh, Mr. Tennis, Mr. Tennis, Mr. Tennis. <laughs> right? I don't know if you play tennis, Deacon Droman, but... He would be the greatest in the category of tennis. Okay, you got it. So when God says, you shall die, die, scholars suggest that that connotes God is speaking of the greatest death. Now, what is the greatest death? It's the death of the greatest life of Adam and Eve. What is the greatest life? Natural or supernatural? Supernatural. 
See, they were created with the supernatural life dwelling in the soul, we call it sanctifying grace, which gave them covenantal and familial relationship with God. And God warns them that if you eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, you will die, die. You will experience the supernatural death of the soul. You will be cut off from covenantal relationship, in other words. So, in other words, if you eat, hey, that's going to be a mortal sin. You see, mortality, death, and supernatural life. Yeah, Ted. Did Satan say, no, you will not die, die? No, well, that's, that's a good question. That's a very good question. I'd have to go and research to see if it's single or double when he says, surely you will not die. That's an excellent question to which I don't have an answer. But it would be interesting because if it is single, right, well then we'd have a, 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 a solid case, right, that would affirm even further he's emphasizing physical death whereas God was emphasizing spiritual death, you know, supernatural death. So that's, that's, that's one for the journey right there. I'll, I will have that answer next week, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, Dan? In, in the Catholic tradition, is there any understanding of whether Adam and Eve were redeemed or... Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Catholic tradition is that they did repent. Actually, in the Eastern, from my understanding, uh, in the Eastern churches, uh, both Catholic and even, you know, the Orthodox churches, etc., they have a saint, you know, they refer to Adam and Eve as Saint Adam and Saint Eve. And so the understanding, even on, in the West, we don't refer to them as saints, but we understand that they did repent. And just like all of the other Old Testament righteous souls who died in God's friendship, you know, they died in God's friendship in anticipation of the graces of the cross of Christ. Because you cannot have... Ch- you cannot have charity or love of God without the cross of Christ and the grace that comes from it. So they would have had charity dwelling in the soul, covenantal relationship with God in anticipation of the graces of the cross of Christ. However, they could not enter into the beatific vision until Christ would redeem the whole of humanity that fell out of relationship with God and Adam, right? They would not be able to enter into the beatific vision until Christ's redemptive act on the cross and his ascension into heaven. Okay, so Adam and Eve would have repented, would have died in friendship with God, dwelling in Sheol or Abraham's bosom, and then following the rest of the captives and the host, as Ephesians 4 speaks of, at Christ's ascension. Okay? All right, so let's see where were we? Okay, the questioning of God's warning about death. Okay, so that's part of the manipulation. Notice, notice right here, just very briefly, if it is in fact the case that Satan is speaking of a physical death, which is the common interpretation of our tradition, and that God was referring to a supernatural death, notice what Satan does. Us. He takes the focus and attention off of the supernatural and puts it on the natural. Getting back to the seven day succession. Are we a people of day six, the natural, or a people of day seven, the supernatural? Where's our focus, right? Is, is my focus on the natural, the natural things of the world? Primarily speaking here, okay, obviously we have to think of the things of the natural world, but I'm speaking primarily. Well, you know, what drives me? What's my motivation? Is it the natural or the supernatural? I think here we can see that the, the part of the manipulative power of Satan is that he gets us to focus on the things of the natural world, getting our attention off of God, getting our attention off of the supernatural life. I mean, think about it. As all of the saints would speak of in the heritage of our Christian faith, you know, die before mortal sin, right? You give your life, you die. I, I can't think what saint would say that. Was it Saint Dominic Savio? I think it was, I, I may be wrong, but there was one particular saint who would say, death before mortal sin. Perpetua. Uh huh? Perpetua. Perpetua? Okay, if it was Saint Perpetua, <laughs> blessed be God. I really don't know, I can't remember, but Rance, if you're right, blessed be God. Death before mortal sin. That exemplifies the Christian mindset, right? Supernatural before the natural. I'm willing to give up my natural life before the supernatural life, right? What did Adam and Eve do? They gave up the supernatural for the sake of keeping the natural. What would Jesus say? If you save your life, you will lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you will save it. What is he speaking of? If you give up your natural life, you will gain the supernatural. For the sake of Christ, of course, and martyrdom, you will gain the supernatural life. So, interesting details here. Food for meditation, right? Something that we can chew on and pray over. All right, the third part of the manipulation here is the assertion that God doesn't want Adam and Eve to be like him. Satan says in Genesis 3, 5, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. 
knowing good and evil, close quote. Isn't it interesting that Satan is tempting Adam and Eve here to be like God when guess what? They were already like God. Remember the author told us they were created in what? The image and likeness of God. Did they already have a knowledge of good and evil? Yeah. God said, don't eat. If you eat bad, that's evil. <laughs> right? What's good? Obey God's will. Eat of the other trees. They had a knowledge of good and evil. So what's going on here in Satan's temptation of God just knows you're going to be like him, knowing good and evil. Well, the Catechism gives us a little commentary. In paragraph 398, the Catechism states this. In that sin, man preferred himself to God, and by that very act, scorned him. He chose himself over and against God, against the requirements of his creaturely status, and therefore against his own good. Seduced by the devil... Here's the key. He wanted to be like God, but without God. Before God, and not in accordance with God. So there was this desire, or Satan was trying to elicit from Adam and Eve, a desire to put themselves before, over, and above God. You see? To be like God, not in accord with God's plan of God's likeness, which is sanctifying grace, knowledge and love, holiness, etc. But to be like God without Him. And that is precisely what Satan did, right? I will not serve. Because the angels are created in the image and likeness of God as well. Intellect, will, holiness, etc. But Satan chose to be like God, apart from God, separated from God. And that's, you know, what's the common phrase? Um, um, you know, um, evil has to have company, right? You know, uh, I can't even think. What's that? Misery loves company, yeah. Uh, and also St. Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company always wants more company, right? Okay? And so this is basically what Satan's trying to do, to get Adam and Eve to do the very thing he did. That is to disobey God, to try to be like God apart from God. Paragraph 399, the Catechism says the following, they become afraid of the God of whom they have conceived a distorted image, that of a God jealous of his prerogatives. And that is God wanting to hold for himself all of his power, knowledge, and love, etc., and not share any of that with Adam and Eve. And that's how Satan gets to them. He manipulates them into distorting the image of God. Boy, man, that's exactly what Satan does today. Tries to get us to think that God is some tyrannical, hoarding God who has no intimacy and no involvement with humanity and with us as his sons and daughters. And so consequently, many people will deny God for those very reasons. But what's the truth of that? My dear friends, as Scripture, as the Christian revelation teaches us, 2 Peter 1, 4, we are called to partake of the divine nature through the supernatural life or sanctifying grace that we receive through baptism Adam and Eve had before the fall is that life that actually enables us to share, as less, paragraph 1 of the Catechism states, in that blessed life of the Trinity. Perfect knowledge. Perfect love. So rather than God being some hoarding tyrannical God, you know, jealous God, keeping everything for himself, he's actually sharing it all with us. And what, is, what does Jesus say in John 3.16? For God so love the world that he gave his only son. Far from holding things for himself, he gives his own son to die for us, to save us, so that we can participate in his life. And as creatures actually be taken up into the divine realm and share in that life of God in mystical, mysterious ways. So, there's the lie of Satan. God's hoarding everything for himself, not sharing anything with us. The Christian gospel counteracts that. And Jesus comes and says, God's sharing his very life with you. And further, 
He so loves us, He wants to get in our bodies <laughs> through the Eucharist and become one flesh with us and remain with us on this earth in the Eucharist until the end of age. Far from holding things back. God in perfect covenant to love does what? Gives everything. Okay, detail number three, Satan's death threat. There's a, another angle that we can look at this phrase from the devil and saying, surely you will not die. And Dr. Scott Hahn suggests this in some of his works, as well as other biblical authors. When Satan approaches Eve, and as we're going to see in a minute, Adam as well, Satan says, you know, if you eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, surely you will not die, right? Okay, now some scholars will suggest that it's possible that this, this is a death threat. Okay, think about it. Adam and Eve, if you eat of the tree, if you disobey God, surely you will not die. What's the implication if you don't eat it, you're going to die. I'm going to kill you. Think of it like this. You know, if you know, we're in the days of Emperor Nero, right? And Emperor Nero brings Joe into, his, into the Colosseum, into his presence, right? And he says, Joe, if you deny Jesus Christ, surely you will not die. What's the implication? Joe, if you don't deny Jesus, the lions are going to come and tip, rip your limbs apart, right? So, some scholars see this statement of Satan, surely you will not die as a death threat. The implication being that if you don't disobey God, you will die. And now think about it. He's the Nahash, right? He's manifesting himself in this dragon-like manifestation and... <sighs> You know, surely you will not die. You know, in this massive, I mean, this, you know, deep, demonic voice, right? There's a guy by the name of Doug Barry and Radix. Listen, my imitation of that ain't nothing compared to what he can do. It's unbelievable, okay? But so you can, you can, it kind of fits with what we said already. A life-threatening manifestation or appearance. And then this life-threatening statement that if you don't disobey God, I'm going to kill you. Once again, what happens? Does Adam stand in front of his bride and say, Thy shall not pass! <laughs> that comes from Lord of the Rings, Gandalf, for any of you, okay? All right, it's a movie thing. <laughs> No, he doesn't. He doesn't defend his bride in, in this death threat. I mean, their lives are being threatened here. And he doesn't defend. He doesn't guard. He doesn't protect his bride. The life of God and the soul. Consequently, there's death. Now, what's interesting, as Dr. Scott Hahn and many others point out, in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, there seems to be an indication that supports this interpretation that Adam sinned out of fear of death. Okay? Here's what the author of Hebrews, I put the picture of St. Paul because that's the common um, consensus on who wrote the book of Hebrews, although we just definitively do not know. Okay? So in our tradition, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but nevertheless the church has declared it is inspired by God. Here we go. Author of Hebrews states, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all all those who fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. Now when it speaks of this subjection to lifelong bondage, okay, it's talking about Christ coming as Redeemer, right? And He's coming to redeem those who are subject to lifelong bondage. That's referencing original sin. Humanity as a whole being under the dominion of Satan. And the author seems to indicate that he's coming to deliver those who through fear of death became subject. So how did all of humanity become subject in a lifelong bondage? Through Adam's sin, right? Well, the author of Hebrews says it's through fear of death that we became subject. Possibly it's through Adam's fear of death that all of humanity becomes subject to the domination or dominion of Satan. Namely, the state of original sin. 
And it would take the redemptive act of Christ on the cross to break the bonds or the chains of Satan that he had a hold on the whole of humanity, reunite the whole of humanity back to God, allowing humans to enter into the beatific vision. And salvation is when you or me individually as a member of that whole, of that human race, receives the life of God in the soul and thus uniting us to God individually. Okay, So the author of Hebrews seems to indicate that humanity became subject to bondage through fear of death, which would point back to Adam's sin. Okay? Now, so that's detail number three. Take it or leave it. Death threat seems reasonable. Death, detail number four. Uh, there are three sources of temptation here in the fall narrative that seem to correspond with what our Catholic tradition refers to as the threefold concupiscence. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. St. John... Uh, elucidates or enumerates these this threefold concupiscence in 1 John 2.16. Okay? So I'm going to start with the middle, middle column there. Okay? In 1 John 2.16, St. John writes about the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. Now in paragraph 377, the catechism interprets what that refers to. The pride of life refers to a distorted self-assertion over and above and before God. Hmm, sounds interesting. Sounds very similar to what we just talked about, about Adam wanting to be like God apart from God, right? The lust of the flesh, the catechism states in paragraph 377, refers to sensory pleasure, right? So the bodily appetite for food, drink, and sex. Lust of the eyes, the catechism interprets as referring to material possession. Why? Because what I see, I want. You see? So when I perceive and I see material goods, I desire to possess those material goods. So that's what the lust of the eyes refers to. Now what's interesting is that these, this threefold concupiscence is what is commonly referred to as the unholy trinity of... Oh, I forgot to insert the third one. My apologies on the PowerPoint. Power, sex, and what? Money. Or money, power, sex, as it's often referred to. Okay, so now keep in mind that would be a what? Distorted view of sex. Sex is good, amen? Created by Almighty God. Be fruitful and multiply, Adam and Eve. Very good and holy, beautiful thing. In that act of communal love, it actually images the communion of love and the Trinity, okay? So it's a beautiful thing. But the distorted view of sex is it, it causes the obsession, and then you have that unholy Trinity. Here's the point. This threefold concupiscence seems to be present in the narrative of the fall of Adam and Eve. There seems to be a way of identifying the threefold concupiscence of self-assertion, distorted self-assertion, uh, which would be pride of life, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. So here we go. In Genesis 3, 5, Satan says to Adam and Eve, you will be like God, right? Knowing good and evil. The implication there, be like God apart from God. So notice Satan is getting Adam and Eve or tempting them to assert themselves in a distorted, unreasonable way. To assert themselves before God, apart from God. I don't need you, God. I can do it on my own. Right? I'm self-sufficient. I can get it done myself. That would be the pride of life. A source of temptation. Notice what Satan's doing. He's appealing to the human desire for self-assertion. That's a good thing to assert, right? To be assertive, to initiate things, to get things done. Gord the Gordon, right? Okay? But Satan is trying to distort that human drive of self-assertion. Now, third source of temptation. Lust of the flesh in Genesis 3, 6. Notice what the scriptures tell us. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good for food. Right? It was good for food. That is, it was good for the bodily appetite of hunger. So there is a... Notice what Satan is doing. He's appealing to the human desire or appetite for food. And is going to use that human desire or appetite to try to get them to disobey God. And so as Satan will do very often, he will appeal to our human appetite for food, drink, and sex. Hence the lust of the flesh, right? And then finally you have Genesis 3, 6. It was the delight for the eyes. Notice the emphasis on the eyes. 
She sees it, Eve sees it, she wants to what? Possess it. So we, there seems to, we seem to see the threefold concupiscence in the manipulative dialogue. Three sources of temptation, you might say. Three areas of the human experience that Satan is appealing to to try to get Adam and Eve to disobey God. And so this is, this is the course of our life today, right? We struggle with the pride of life. We struggle with the lust of the flesh. We struggle with the lust of the eyes. It was present there in the garden, and it's still present with us today. But thanks be to God for the grace of Jesus. <laughs> he helps us overcome those things. Amen? Okay, detail number five. And here's, I should have put this detail, this detail at the beginning because I've constantly been referring to Adam and Eve, right? We commonly think it was all Eve's fault, right? If that woman, man, just would have got it right, <laughs> we wouldn't be in the mess we're in, right? But guess what? It wasn't Eve's fault, totally. It was primarily Adam's fault. Why? Because Adam was there with Eve the whole time. The text, there is a text that seems to indicate this. In Genesis 3, 6, we read the following. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband and he ate. Close quote. Now, in my imagination, I've often thought of Adam just, you know, being way laba, somewhere that's Cajun language for like way over there, okay? Adam was just off doing his thing, and the whole time, Satan is dialoguing with Eve alone. But this text seems to indicate possibly that Adam was right there the whole time. Because she takes of the fruit and she gives it to Adam. There's no indication that there, well, you know, Eve ate the fruit and then later during the day, while Adam was out gardening, you know, or tilling the soil, Eve gave him the fruit. No, it indicates he's right there. What's the point? The point is this, my dear friends. Adam had the opportunity to gourd at the moment the serpent or the Nahash comes into play. He fell in gourding the garden. And when the Nahash begins to dialogue and seduce his bride, because the text does emphasize that the Nahash is dialoguing with Eve, right? There is that emphasis. But as this text indicates, Adam was there all along, and guess what? He was silent. Rather than redeeming himself, I guess you could say, rather than doing what he failed to do, standing in between the Nahash and his bride, making up for his lack of guardianship, he fails again, and he's silent the whole time. While the Nahash manipulates his bride, Eve. Interesting, huh? What's the role of a man? The true identity of a man is to protect and guard his bride from the manipulative power of the Nahash. The greatest weapon of Satan, my dear friends, the weapon he used to cause chaos for all of humanity and take humanity away from God, was a silent man. A man who was silent rather than defending and protecting his bride. Something we can think about, huh? And meditate. I know for me, especially, right? It's kind of a shot in the arm and saying, get off your butt, Carlo, and do your manly duties, right? <laughs> okay? All right, so now, once again, as I mentioned before, Dan, th- in light of this narration of things, it makes sense. You notice how the emphasis is a lot on Adam. It makes perfect sense of why in the New Testament Paul does not emphasize Eve as far as the sin that leads to death for humanity. He speaks of death coming into the world for humanity through Adam. Why? Because Adam was the head of the human race and it was primarily his role to protect the human race in him, so to speak, protect the life of God in his soul, protect his bride Eve from the devil, but he failed to do so. Okay? Now, detail number six of the narrative, before we start looking at some theological insights, and I'm starting to run out of time here, uh, I want to just very briefly go over the covenantal curses. After Adam and Eve fall in sin, now keep in mind, we're going to get to this next week, before God starts listing the curses, 
God makes a promise of redemption and salvation in Genesis 3.15. Right after they disobey God and they sin, God makes the promise of redemption. I will set enmity between you, uh, Satan, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head, but you shall bruise his heel. There's the promise of redemption. We're going to look at it next week. But then after the promise comes the curses. What's the point? Notice how before the curse there's a promise of hope. Before the punishment, there's a promise of redemption. Showing sort of that fatherly care of God. God's not just this masterful tyrant. You know, you disobeyed me. Wow! Slapping the, you know, the slave or whatever. Whipping the slave. But there's a promise of love there. Okay. Detail number six, the covenant of the curses. You have the curses for the characters in the divine drama. Curse for the serpent. Eat dust. Right? Isn't that interesting? What does that mean? As Dr. Brant Petrie suggests in some of his lectures, it's possible that refers to the curse of Satan being the lust of man. Satan's curse is to lust after man. He wants to devour man. Why that interpretive application? Well, notice how it says, eat dust. When's the last time we read about dust in the Genesis narrative? When God made man from the dust of the earth. The last time the image of dust is mentioned in the narrative is reference to man. Here we have dust being mentioned again in regards to Satan eating dust. And the way the Hebraic authors wrote is that they left clues and details for us to make the interpretive applications. And very often when you find repetition like that, there's a connection between the two. And this is just one example among many in the Old Testament narration of things. Okay, so the curse of the serpent, devour of man. Curse for the woman. Pain in childbirth. Desire for the husband. And that would be a disordered desire, okay? And we can talk about that and go into that, but I just don't have time. Pain in childbirth. Desire for the husband. Under the domination of husband. So the husband having the tendency to dominate the wife rather than serve her, reverence her, etc. Uh, curses for man in general. Uh, or curse for the male. Fruitless toil of the ground. Work by the sweat of the brow. Okay. Curse for the human family. Exiled out the garden. There's a figure exiled from the garden. What's the garden of paradise? Union with God. Exiled from the garden. What's that a figure of? Adam and Eve fell out of relationship with God. Consequently, the whole human family fell out of relationship with God because the whole human family was in the loins of Adam, so to speak. Was in Adam, the head of the human race. Okay, what's the rationale behind the curses? All right, there's two possible rational explanations of the curses, as you see there on the PowerPoint. Number one, it's covenant judgment. It's the curses of the covenant being executed. One thing that we know in, in biblical theology and covenantal theology is that whenever a covenant is made, there are blessings, there are curses. Okay? And we've already suggested in previous sessions, in light of the details of the creation account, what is going on? What is the author trying to communicate? God is entering into a covenantal relationship with the human family with all of creation, right? And so if that is a covenant, well then there is blessing, there are blessings to the covenant and curses. What happens? Adam and Eve, that particular party of the covenant, fails in their terms of the covenant. Consequently, what do they invoke upon themselves? The curses of the covenant. The curses of pain and childbirth, working by the sweat of your brow, possibly could be the curses of the covenant. It's covenantal judgment, in other words. What happens to the people of Israel throughout salvation history? They're in a covenant with Yahweh. Amen? What happens when they're unfaithful? Army comes in, wipes them out, takes them into captivity. They're exiled, right? That's the curses of the covenant. So these curses, it's not just God being some tyrant, right? Like a master to the slave, but it's a part of the covenantal relationship. It's the curses that they invoke upon themselves. Now, the second uh, rational explanation of the curses that are bestowed upon Adam and Eve is that these curses are actually pedagogical in nature. They have sort of a redemptive value to them because Adam and Eve were called to covenantal love, which as we're going to see in a few moments, is to give of themselves totally in self-sacrificial love. 
But because they fail to do that, God's going to have to teach them how to do it through the suffering that they will have to endure, which are the covenantal curses. So think about it. Child, uh, now, how is the curse of Satan redemptive for him? I don't think it applies to Satan, okay, because he can't be redeemed. But there seems to be a redemptive value for Adam and Eve. Think of Eve, pain in childbirth, right? What is Eve doing in childbirth with that pain? She's giving life. She's sacrificing herself for the sake of life, right? And she's going to have to learn how to do that through suffering, through the pain. Eve learns how to lay down her life, so to speak, sacrifice herself for the sake of life, for the sake of the other. We look at Adam. What is Adam going to have to do? He's going to have to work by the sweat of the brow, tilling the land in hardship. And through that hardship, Adam will learn how to suffer and lay down his life, sacrifice himself for the sake of the life of the family, which is what he was called to do from the very get-go. Lay down his life in face of the Nahash and protect in obedience to God's will to protect his bride Eve, but he failed to do so. God has to teach him. How does he teach him? What's the pedagogical methodology? What's the pedagogy? That would be just one word for all of what I just said. <laughs> Suffering, toil, hardship. Therein is a clue, my dear friends, to the answer of suffering, of why God allows suffering in this world, in this imperfect world, to teach us, to grow in virtue, to teach us how to offer ourself in self-sacrificial love, which is the essence of covenantal love. It's the essence of the relationship with God. Now, in light of all of that, this brings us to the theological insights that we can extract from this. First, and I'll run through them real quick and let you go. The nature of covenantal love is self-sacrificial love. The total, of, the total gift of self. My dear friends, follow me. If there was a covenant between God and, he, and Adam and Eve, which the biblical author seems to suggest in, in light of the detail, there's a covenant there. Now, what is an essential uh, constitutive element of every covenant? Sacrifice. That's right. Good job. Sacrifice. Well, what is the sacrifice for that covenant between God and Adam and Eve? It's themselves. The sacrifice is themselves to sacrifice their own lives, their own will for the sake of the will of God. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Whatever that symbolizes, they were called to sacrifice themselves for the sake of God. So the nature of covenantal love is self-sacrifice, total gift of self, okay? Now, second theological insight. Adam's greatest failure was to lay down his own life in sacrifice. Out of fear of losing his own life, he fails to obey God's will and protect and guard the garden and Eve from the ferocious beast. Out of fear of losing his own life, Adam failed to sacrifice himself in obeying God's command to guard the garden. Out of fear of losing his natural life, Adam failed to spare and guard the supernatural life. You see? Adam's greatest failure was to... Adam's greatest failure was not to lay down his own life in sacrifice. I misspoke while ago, okay? Does that make sense? All right. Third theological insight, Adam sets the pattern of failure in covenantal love. Every, every single covenantal mediator and major figure in salvation history that follows, they fail in covenantal love as well. Noah gets drunk. Adam, Abraham loses trust in God's promise, takes Hagar the concubine because he didn't trust God's promise for a son from Sarah. Moses loses his temper in the desert and disobeys God and strikes the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock and consequently he can't go in the promised land. Israel worships the golden calf, the holy cow, right? David commits adultery with Bathsheba. So we see that all throughout salvation history, Adam's paradigm of failure and covenant to love, every single major figure in salvation history fails as well. And so it requires what? One to come and be the covenantal mediator between God and man and succeed in covenantal love. And so this leads us to our fourth theological insight. 
And that is, Adam's failure in covenantal love is the negative side of Christ's success in covenantal love. Getting back to what the Catechism stated at the outset of tonight's lecture, the good news of Jesus and the fall of man are the reverse side of one another. The fall of Adam and his failure in self-sacrificial covenantal love is the very springboard, you might say, for understanding and grasping the true meaning of why Jesus comes, gives himself totally in self-sacrificial love, succeeds in covenantal love. I leave you with this thought. Have you ever wondered why Jesus went all the way to the cross and died? I mean, one drop of blood from Jesus would have been sufficient enough to redeem the human race, right? I mean, he could have just willed it. Why did he go all the way and die? Why did he go all the way to the cross and lay down his life? Because Adam failed to do it. The first Adam was called to guard the guard. Lay down his life in self-sacrificial covenantal love for his bride Eve in obedience to God's will. He failed to do that. And in order to make right with the first Adam wrong, the son of the father becomes man and he goes all the way to the cross, lays down his life in perfect covenantal self-sacrificial love and thus makes right the first Adam wrong. And through that death on the cross, what does he do? He guards his bride, the new Eve, the church, which is you and me. And he saves us, friends, and he leads us to that restoration of the garden of paradise, which we were exiled from through the first Adam. The second Adam brings us back. And the perfect realization of that garden of paradise, of perfect communion with God, will be ultimately in the beatific vision in heaven, and then even more perfectly in the final perfection of the kingdom of the new heaven and the new earth. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, we thank you and we praise you for your masterful divine plan of salvation that you have revealed to us throughout the history of mankind. Thank you for the sacred scriptures and telling us this divine story. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who gives us the gift of salvation. We thank you for the church that Jesus gave us through the sacraments where that divine life is continuously communicated to us and infused within our souls so that we can partake of the divine nature and share in that blessed Trinitarian life of perfect knowledge and love. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.